All right, you're good to go. Hi there, everyone. For those of you who just heard my short introduction, you're going to hear it again. <laughs> my name is Dr. Michael Wald. I want to welcome each and every one of you for uh, joining myself tonight and this uh, wonderful presentation, if I do say so myself, sponsored by Trinity as well as Nutritional Frontiers. And uh, for those of you who don't know me very briefly, um, I've been practicing, as I mentioned, for 28 years in clinical nutrition. I first went to chiropractic college. I'm a second generation doctor of chiropractic. Then I completed medical school, then received my master's in human nutrition, received a few board certifications, got my dietitian's license, sports nutritionist degrees. I have lots of interests in all areas of, of nutrition and wellness. And that's what brings me here today. I mentioned a few moments ago that I sought out Nutritional Frontiers and asked them to allow me to present for them because I was that impressed with their commitment to people. And I want to acknowledge each and every one of you, too, for your time tonight and your commitment to those of you who are currently practicing to your patients. And for those of you that are students, I want to congratulate you especially for having the forethought for spending this extra time on this uh, level of education. So as you can see from your screen, we're going to be discussing clinical pearls, which is a term that basically means something that's important, something that's special. But clinical pearl does not mean it's the, these are the only things. These may be five supplements that we're speaking about tonight that are important. And I do believe uh, truly that they are foundational. They're essential for a clinical practice. But there are other things as well. But these, these are quite special, as I think you'll agree, in a few moments. As you can see again on your screen, there are more than five supplements named here. We're going to go through the first five that start on the top left down. The other supplements we might review at another time, but they're not included in this presentation. Before any conversation I think that's meaningful uh, takes place regarding the use of nutritional supplements, I think we should spend some time thinking about, well, how do we dose a patient? So as you can see on the top left corner here, one way of optimizing our nutri nutrient doses for our clients is to recommend dosages that are on the supplement container. So that is one way of doing things. So if the container says the client or patient should take one capsule or one dropper, twice a day, that means that the company, in this case Nutritional Frontiers, has put some serious thought to dosages based on evidence, based on studies. But as you know, your patients may not have been studied. They probably were not part of those studies. And studies, as we know, if, if they're worth anything, involve a large number of people or perhaps or animal studies. My point, though, is averages do not reflect individual needs. So quite often, we need to go beyond the dosage on the bottle. Number two, we can adjust our supplement doses based upon patient tolerance. So those of you in clinical practice probably know, as I do, that often you'll make a recommendation to a patient, and they will say to you that they had an adverse reaction. And some practitioners who are... Uh, not too quick on their feet or a, a maybe a bit new to practice might get a bit scared at that and say, well, oh my goodness, uh, I guess you should just stop taking that. But when we're dealing with changes in diet and lifestyle, including nutritional supplement use, quite often a patient might have a, a, a side effect that uh, is not particularly comfortable, but does not necessarily mean that we stop use of the supplement. We might temporarily we might then begin it again at another dose. So I just want you all, uh, I want you all to be mindful that just because a patient has a symptom, it doesn't mean, or an adverse reaction, it doesn't mean that we should toss that supplement aside. Our next bullet says we can adjust our doses based upon patient compliance. Well, I'll ask my patients often, you know, how are you doing with the supplement recommendations? And they'll often say to me something like, well, you know, I often don't, make it to take that second dose or that third dose, Dr. Wall. And if that is a recurring issue, I would readjust the supplement doses the best that I can for the maximum benefit, maybe once a day, because they've admitted that they can take them once a day. So 
this kind of these kinds of adjustments can make the difference between helping someone in the short and the long term. And then the last bullet on the left is adjust based upon patient response. So if a patient is doing well after a while, we may want to taper them off the supplement or reduce the supplement in some way. And then when we look at the upper uh, right hand of the screen, it says adjust and determine based upon laboratory work. So for those of you, depending on your state, uh, and if you are allowed to draw and interpret blood work and other types of uh, tissue samples, uh, you'll have an advantage, obviously, uh, compared to those practitioners that cannot look at laboratory work. Looking at blood work really can help optimize dose for clients. Now, that doesn't mean that every vitamin or mineral blood level is accurate. For example, B vitamin levels in the serum or the plasma only represent the last two or three or five days or so of intake. Vitamin D plasma, for example, though, being a fat-soluble nutrient, has a far better track record of predictability of overall vitamin D storage. So my point here is that laboratory can be of help, but we don't ever want to use it exclusively. A good practitioner will have a patient before him or her and that practitioner will consider the signs and symptoms and health goals, et cetera, of that client in context with laboratory work. For example, if the laboratory work says that the TSH level, the thyroid stimulating hormone is elevated and the patient is fatigued, well, that one plus one in that case means two, that, that that's related very well. But in other people, someone might have a TSA that's elevated, but they don't have an energy problem. So once again, lab is important, but not everything. The next bullet, comparing the patient to average and healthy. We're going to talk about this on the next slide. And also, we can base our nutrition on what are known as weak body systems. And that's what's called uh, my blood detective report. So the next few screens, I'll only spend about possibly three minutes on these. I just wanted to let you know that everyone listening to uh, this presentation is entitled to a free blood detective report. You can send me a copy of your, actually you can do an interpretation by accessing the blood detective website of your patient's blood work or your own, and an entire interpretive report will be provided. Now, if you look at this page, you'll see on the left the names of the different laboratory tests. And then there's a results section of the patient's results. And then the darker section in the center are the clinical ranges. Those are your average or so-called normal ranges. And then all the way to the right, you'll see the functional ranges. And that's what I call, those are the healthy ranges. So generally speaking, a, per, a patient might come to you, and their laboratory work might be completely normal. The clinical numbers, unlike this sample here, might be all within the range. But if you compare them to healthy people, to the far right. It'll usually reveal some of the underlying biochemical issues with this patient. Now, the blood detective software will take the results of your patient's blood chemistry and compare them both to average and healthy people and provide specific dose suggestions of different nutrients, a complete outline of what they need to take, and also recommend dietary advice based on the chemistry of your patient. You know, Dr. Roger Williams, some of you might know that name, in the, in the 1950s, he's a twice uh, Nobel Prize winner in B vitamin chemistry. He coined the term biochemical individuality. And it just occurred to me about 20 years ago or so that many practitioners give lip service to treating the patients as individuals, but actually don't. This was just one of the ways that I came up with by creating a software program to take the patient's individual chemistry, convert it into specific supplement suggestions, dietary suggestions. This report will also tell us, as you can see to the far left, for this one patient, all of these body system names came up. But if you look to the far right, the functional abnormals, it'll tell you the number of abnormal tests relative to each of the weak body systems on the left. So you can have the blood detective system recommend nutrition for your patient based on, let's say, the system with the most amount of abnormalities or maybe the top two or top three, depending on how much detail you want to give the patient. And on this next screen, 
it recommends different supplements from one of the companies chosen. On this screen, on food plans, you'll see to the left different food plans mentioned. These are 10-day breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack food plans, which can be automatically printed from the blood detective based upon what you choose blood detective to provide you. So, for example, on the far right, under functional abnormal, you, might, you can see at the top that there are nine abnormal tests, which you might say, well, then let's give the patient the moderate protein food plan. That'll take care of their, their nine abnormalities. If you want to give them 20 days, you can take the one with nine and also the next one with the highest number of abnormalities, which is six. Here's just another example of one of the pages of a 10-day food plan. And then here you have a single page which gives you what's called the evaluation report. So for every abnormal test, the blood detective will tell you what the abnormal test is. In this case, at the top left, you'll see chloride. And you'll see that there's an L uh, right before where it says functional on the right. And it tells you that the chloride is low compared to healthy or functional, but it's normal compared to the average. Then it'll tell you what the test chloride means for low medically and nutritionally, what conditions might cause this, what laboratory tests you might consider in addition to those you may have done already, and so forth. So for those of you, once again, who would like a free run of a blood detective report, you simply need to email me at info at blood detective. So now we're going to move on to the supplements and their clinical uses. I would suggest that you have a your computers in front of you, or at least a pen and paper, because there's there's a lot of wonderful clinical pearls that I'm going to share with you that I've learned over the years. So our first supplement is called Adrenomo. And at the top of the page, I'll open many faces of stress because when we're talking about the adrenals, most of you out there know how pivotal the adrenal gland is in both health and disease. And it's that balance of how well the body can homeostatically manage the stress response that can make the difference between the quality of health, life, and death of the patient. So this particular supplement, Adrenamax, has under the supplement facts section, as you can see, several different herbs. There's cordyceps, there's panax ginseng, there's erythrococcus, ashwagandha, licorice root, and rhodiola. What I should mention now, which is a which is a pivotal concept in nutritional care, at least I believe, is being mindful of what's known as nutritional synergism. Where we can combine these particular herbs, these six herbs, but their effects physiologically might be closer to 10 or 20. In other words, we can get super physiological effects if we combine synergistic herbs or any synergistic nutrients appropriately. So these, of course, have been very well synergistically balanced by nutritional frontiers, giving standardized percentages of active ingredients, which studies show are what, what is required for uh, treating our patients. So you can see what the suggested use here is on the bottle. But as I mentioned earlier, how much we might actually give to a patient could be quite varied. But certainly, we might want to start somewhere in this recommended area. Now, I do also uh, have here that, maybe it's on the second page, but I note that when this supplement is used, I usually begin uh, having a patient take it uh, in the morning because overall adrenal function should be at its best in the early morning hours. And as the day goes on, generally speaking, adrenal function diminishes over the course of the day. And of course, in individuals that have health problems, it's all over the place and it's quite erratic. So what we're trying to do, obviously, is to balance that patient uh, homeostatically so that they can heal better, they can control inflammation better, their immune system can work more adequately. In other words, we can help modify the different stressors that affect disease. So some of those stressors I just mentioned, let me just say them again. Inflammation, obviously. Oxidation, fundamental for both tissue repair and disrepair autoimmune reactions and also hypoimmune problems uh, are affected by the resiliency of the adrenal glands. 
the adrenal glands are obviously a hormonal gland, but they're actually a neurohormonal gland affecting and affected by the nervous system and other hormones and many other relationships, of course. And when the adrenal function is inadequate, either too high or too low, we're left with various disease or dysfunctions in our patients. For example, low adrenaline over the course of time could cause catabolism, which means the loss of lean body mass. And it is known and very well established that the loss of lean body mass in our patients is inversely related to all cause morbidity and mortality. Said another way, the more lean body mass we lose, the greater our disease risk and the greater the loss of quality of life. So very important, needless to say, that we need to support our adrenal glands. We'll start off with licorice root at the bottom of this page. And there are various uses. I couldn't possibly name them all for licorice root, but it can be used for both hypo and hyperthyroidism and just general adrenalism, various chronic conditions, meaning anything that lingers, fatigues the body. I know that's not a particularly technical term, but it does fatigue the body, chronic conditions, wearing down the adrenal glands. So most of the time, when we use a formula like Adrenamax, we're using it for hypo conditions, like hypoadrenalism or hypothyroidism. Of course, with stress of any type, whether it's uh, physical stress, emotional stress, you name it, allergies, inflammation, hormonal imbalances. Hypertension is a very important one. When a person uh, grows older, for example, they may have weakened heart tissue, which might cause hypotension. And by increasing adrenal function, we can increase the uh, function of the myocytes of the heart. I won't read every one of these imbalances, but I do want to go to the very last sentence here where it says the glycerinates, which are some of the active ingredients in licorice, inhibit 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2 which is the enzyme responsible for inactivating cortisol. This is key. Not only does licorice modify this enzyme, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment, but the synergistic effects of all of these herbs uh, play upon this particular enzyme system. So as it says here, once again, the glycerinates inhibit what's known as a beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2. Picture in your mind for a moment, because we do not have a flow chart, that we have cortisol, which we know is a, an active glucocorticoid. Cortisol converts into the inactive cortisone. So licorice and the other synergies here, more or less, inhibit the 11-beta hydroxysteroid type 2. If we inhibit the 11-beta hydroxysteroid type 2, if we inhibit that enzyme that allows cortisol to go to cortisone, then we will accumulate more cortisol, which is, again, the active glucocorticoid. So what is amazing about the combination of these herbs is that they can non-selectively modify this particular enzyme system and another one which is called the very same thing, 11-beta-hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, but it's called type 1. You may want to spend a little time on your own investigating type 1 and type 2 of this enzyme because they both play with each other to balance out, here's the point, to balance out cortisol and cortisone. Cortisol being the active glucocorticoid and cortisone being the inactive. By switching back and forth, this is how these herbs act as true adaptogens upon the adrenal hormones, and not just cortisol. When cortisol is increased, usually DHEA, the other, uh, another adrenal hormone, is also increased, but not every time. Nothing is every time. And when cortisol is decreased, usually 
DHEA is decreased. So this is what we mean by adaptogens. Dr. Wolf, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Can I get you to sure. try your different mic? We're getting a lot of reverb from your current mic. And it's okay. Tough. Actually, um, yeah, I understand. I am not using the mic. Okay. I could use a headset. Let's try the headset I'm not if we get clearer. Because okay. we're missing about a third of what you're saying because we can't quite hear it with Got it. the muffle. Is this any better? Yeah, let's let's try that for a few slides and see how we go. Okay, sure, sure. So we're talking about licorice root, and we've just had a brief conversation about how licorice root, along with the other synergistic herbs in this particular formula, help to modify the expression of an enzyme that's abbreviated 11-beta-HSD2. So what licorice does, like these other herbs, is that they modify the expression of that enzyme, helping to balance a, delicately the, the conversion of cortisol, the active glucocorticoid, and the inactive glucocorticoid form, which is cortisone. By bouncing back and forth and modifying the enzyme function, these herbs act as true adaptogens. I hope that was clearer for everyone. How does that sound? Yes, it sounds better. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. Great. So as we can see on the current screen, licorice root also affects epinephrine and norepinephrine secreted by the medulla and cortex respectively. And these are quite important for the stress response, as I'm sure everyone knows. We've got norepinephrine, which forms epinephrine. And that's part of the stress response. That is part of the normal stress response. If we have excessive stress response, then we have breakdown of tissue. We also have a consumption, so to speak, of a variety of nutritional cofactors that help balance out the epinephrine, norepinephrine part of the stress pathway, such as SAMe and magnesium, which required for the conversion, it's not on your screen, but of norepinephrine to epinephrine. So the most important side effect of licorice, which I should mention in glycerizin, are hypertension. You have to know this. If someone has hypotension, then licorice is gonna be a wonderful thing for them. But if they have hypertension, it could be a problem. So licorice and glycerizin can cause hypertension and hypokalemic induced secondary disorders. By lowering potassium, they can cause all sorts of muscle spasms, including abnormal uh, muscular function of the heart, which can which will show up on EKG findings. Licorice side effects are increased by hypokalemia, prolonged gastrointestinal transit time, and decreased type 2 11-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase activities. Again, spend some time learning a bit more about this enzyme. It's key for how all of these herbs work. The last paragraph here, biochemical studies indicate that the glycerinates inhibit this 11-beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 2. By inhibiting that type 2, whenever you inhibit an enzyme, you will increase the accumulation of what came before the enzyme. So if cortisol becomes cortisone, and we need 11-beta HSD2 to move cortisol to cortisone, if we shut that enzyme down, the cortisol will accumulate. And we may need that. Too much of that is chronic stress response to one point, and then the other point of the chronic stress response is exhaustion phase. As we move on to finish the last paragraph here, the last sentence simply that the effects are reversible upon withdrawal of licorice or glycerin. So if you come across patients that you find these hyperadrenal symptoms, they're sweating a lot, increased bowel movements, they're jittery, they have insomnia, their blood pressure has increased. All you need to do is either decrease the product a bit, perhaps take it with food to slow down its absorption, or stop it entirely for a day or two or three, whatever it takes for everything to come back to normal, and you start again at a lower dose, generally with food, because obviously food will slow down the absorption into the bloodstream. I wanna move on to cordyceps senesis. Now, 
you may not think that you're going to see many patients with IgA nephropathy, which is also known as Berger's disease. But I, I gave this example because cordyceps has a tremendous amount of evidence for immune modulation. But in this particular condition, we know that IJ nephropathy is the most common form of primary glomerular nephritis and an important cause of kidney failure. Kidney failure is much more common than some of you might think. And in fact, your patients in their 50s, for example, in 60s, particularly in their 60s, they have some amount of chronic renal disease or, or chronic renal failure. And their doctors barely mention it to them because they, there's nothing that they can do. But cordyceps has been shown to help kidneys recover. However, if your patient has outright kidney failure that's greater than 30%, you need to be extremely cautious when you give any supplements whatsoever simply because the kidney is not working very well to excrete the excess. So you might, the patient might experience side effects from anything you're giving. For example, one of the most common contraindications in terms of nutrition for kidney failure is magnesium. In all the textbooks, if someone's having renal failure, you don't give them magnesium because they can suffer from magnesium toxicity. The same thing is true for lots of other nutrients. I'm not saying do not give nutrition for renal failure. It's just something that you need to perhaps look into in a bit more detail beyond the scope of this particular course. So cordyceps is a a parasitic fungus that has a long history in Chinese medicine for the treatment of nephritis. Now, interleukin-22 producing T helper cells have been reported to be involved in this form of renal disease. Th22 cells link the immune response to tissue inflammation. Cordyceps may modulate what's known as chemotaxis of the Th22 cells to suppress inflammation. What does that mean in English? <laughs> I'll tell you right now. Basically, Th22 cells do modify the immune response and inflammation. They produce cytokines. It's the interleukin-22 is a cytokine. Cordyceps modifies the production of interleukin-22, modifying the inflammatory response. Remember, inflammation is a double-edged sword. Inflammation is needed to break down cancer cells, abnormal and old in dying tissues so that they can be replaced. Just like we need a balance of oxidation and reduction, we need a balance of inflammation and inflammatory control. Once again, cordyceps shows a remarkable adaptive capacity to modify inflammation in a large number of diseases, as do all of these herbs. Panax ginseng, an old favorite. The ginsenosides are part of the main active components of ginseng. The mechanism of ginseng saponins, which is another active component, exerts anti-stress effects by reducing the secretion of plasma steroids, which is one of them is known as CORT. So Panax, again, modifies the over-excretion of steroids, which can wear down systems. Enhancement of immune function and providing anti-stress effects. That's a general benefit of Panax. Anti-inflammatory effects are promoted here by suppressing the production of a whole bunch of various cytokines and thus regulating signal pathways called nuclear factor kappa B and activator protein one. These are just some of the inflammatory mediators that Panax ginseng helps to, helps to balance. What's also interesting about Panax is that it shows antidepressant-like action of the, of the uh, ginsenicides, which they believe is mediated by a hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, sort of hormone, neurohormonal rebalancing. What is also extraordinary to me is the last comment here, that Panax might actually affect what's called BDNF in brain tissue, that's brain-derived neurotrophic factor. So I'm writing a book called The Holistic Brain, and it's all about protecting the brain, anything nervous system. And Panax shows remarkable ability to increase the hypocampal or hippocampal production of brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This factor is needed for stability and repair of the brain. It does so much more, but that's what you need to know about this. 
So anything neurologic as well. Erythrococcus. It's not commonly known that it has antihyperglycemic action. It's produced by one of the active ingredients, syringinin, an active principle purified from the rhizome and the root part. So for those patients like diabetic patients or the so-called pre-diabetic people, erythrococcus and this particular product is very good because it modifies adrenal function, which affects all sorts of hormones that we've been discussing, which in excess, for example, like cortisol, will cause pro-inflammatory conditions, which will increase insulin resistance, uh, uh, adipose fat storage, increase in lipids, all of that mediated through blood sugar balance. Also, we know that erythrococcus can affect the secretion of beta endorphin from the adrenal medulla. So beta endorphin, like any endorphin, is a painkiller. It's also an immune modulator. And it's a type of natural opioid. But it also has an effect upon insulin. And finally, muscle spasms, pain, fatigue, insomnia, mood, chronic illness, these are some of the more common indications of the use of erythrococcus, and you'll get even better effects when you use them synergistically in this particular formula. So just think of the endorphin aspect of what I just mentioned and how that will help muscle spasms and pain. And when you reduce pain and reduce inflammation, which endorphins also do, you can enhance the energy of the individual, reducing their fatigue, helping their sleep, improving their mood, and helping them heal better as we move across each of those conditions or indications for treatment at the bottom of the slide. Ashwagandha. You should be aware that not just ashwagandha, but most of the herbs I just mentioned, there may be some drug nutrient interactions. The blood detective program provides the drug nutrient interactions, and these, of course, you can look up individually. But as it says here, medications that decrease the immune system or immunosuppressants may react with ashwagandha because ashwagandha is considered, along with most of these herbs, an immune modulator or something that might increase the immune system. But I want to say something more about that. Over my decades of practice, patients have said to me, Dr. Wald, why did you give me these herbs which increase the immune system when I have an autoimmune disease like MS or diabetes or lupus or Sjogren's disease, or ulcerative colitis? And I remind them that these herbs are not immune enhancers. They are adaptogens. They are immune modulators. We need to use the right terms. So in a perfect world, or quite often in clinical practice, I can tell you from my personal experience, this particular herb and the other herbs, when used correctly, if someone does have autoimmune, too much of a good thing, it can help bring that autoimmunity down, lowering that inflammation, improving healing. And if someone has a hypo or low immune system, ashwagandha can help bring it up. And the reason for this, the simple reason on the surface is that these herbs help support the integrity of the tissues of the body, the organs, glands, tissues, all of that, so that they work the way they're supposed to. And that's where that natural balance comes and that innate intelligence comes from. Ashwagandha may also lower cholesterol, I'm sorry, uh, cortisol, which is why we use it for those patients that have conditions and personality types that are hyperadrenal. And by helping to balance out the adrenals, since the adrenals, of course, communicate with the thyroid, we can help regulate thyroid function. It's also used, ashwagandha, for high blood pressure. So by lowering cortisol and helping mineral balance, for example, and, and of course, there are many other mechanisms. We can help blood pressure, insomnia, chronic fatigue, and in particular, impotence associated with anxiety or exhaustion, which is actually a, a major source of impotence, particularly in men. And in terms of a few other studies, ashwagandha has shown to increase swimming time in rats in physical working capacity tests. In other words, these rats, they can swim longer. So if you're a rat, and this is great news, but actually it's quite good. I, I treat many athletes, even Olympians, and this is one of the, uh, the things that I use, and they tell me that it improves their performance. But we know that ashwagandha can increase uh, heart weight by increasing the... Uh, the myocardium strength 
and density, and also the glycogen content of the heart, which is the energy that's needed. And ashwagandha possesses no toxicities up to a dose of about 100 milligrams per kilogram, which is a lot. So we're not gonna go that high. So now we're talking about uh, rhodiola. So rhodiola demonstrates multi-target effects. Everything I've just mentioned has multi-target effects. That's so wonderful. That's the wonderful thing about the natural healthcare. These herbs, they hit lots of things because they're fundamental. And from an evolutionary standpoint, we, we consume them all the time and now we're lacking them. So rhodiola demonstrates multi-target effects on various levels of regulation of cell response to stress affecting various components of the neuroendocrine system. It's even known as a hormone thermostat. Again, an adaptogen, one way or another, modifying neurotransmitter receptor and molecular networks associated with mood. So that's the thing to know about rhodiola. It's very good as a mood balancer. I do want to mention, though, the literature does say to avoid its use in those with bipolar. I have had opposite personal experience and have used it for this, but I just wanted to be politically correct and mention that that would be a contraindication. Rhodiola does improve hyperglycemia, and we know why. It increases beta endorphin secretion from the adrenal glands to activate opioid uh, mu receptors, not just in rats, it happens in patients. So on a blood test, you're going to see in he a hemoglobin A1C uh, normalize. So we know, according to most labs, first of all, hemoglobin A1C, uh, to those of you students that may or may not be familiar with it, it's a several week average of blood glucose. It's a non-fasting assessment of blood glucose. And we want to have anything for a 7.5 uh, or higher for most labs is considered pre-diabetic. I like to have hemoglobin A1C at 5.4 because based on my studies, and that's what's in my blood detective uh, program. That's the place to be. And um, there's also something called fructosamine. That's fructosamine, which is a two-week average of blood sugar. That has some utility as well. These are non-fasting tests. One last thing on blood sugar. Even in a non-fasting blood sample, non-fasting folks, if the glucose is greater than 85, that patient is probably a pre-diabetic. And when I first discovered this and checked those patients of mine that did not fast, which you would expect would have higher blood glucose, they in fact did. But every single one that was eight, above 85 had a hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 or greater, meaning that they were so-called pre-diabetic or insulin resistant. So let's move on to one of my favorites, buffered C in a capsule form. So we're gonna get lots of clinical pearls right now. Now we all know the basics about buffered C or vitamin C. It's essential for the synthesis of collagen and uh, glycosaminoglycans for a pair of basically all the connective tissue in the body, which include skin, blood vessels, tendons, joints, and bones. Now I have every single one of my patients perform what's known as a vitamin C flush, which means they take two buffered C capsules every 30 minutes until they get watery diarrhea. At that point, they generally never call me again. No, I don't mean that. What happens, when that happens, so they take two capsules every 30 minutes until they have watery diarrhea, they stop. Then they write down how many capsules of vitamin C it took for them to get that watery diarrhea. That's bowel tolerance, folks. The amount of vitamin C that that patient needs is not that, that much, it's two thirds of that amount you can actually titrate the patient's need for vitamin C. There's no very good blood test or urine test for vitamin C levels because we all know that a person could have normal vitamin C levels, but they might need 100 times that to deal with cancer. I also like to use urinary vitamin C because once the body stores are complete, there'll be some spillover of C in the urine. I also check ascorbic acid relative to the oxidized form of vitamin C or dehydroascorbate. So keep in mind the vitamin C flush procedure. If your patient is particularly weak, you might wanna have them start with just a capsule and go one capsule every 30 minutes. If the patient does not flush by five hours, I generally stop and I do something different. 
The next area here, vitamin C is, requ is a required coenzyme for various enzymes that catalyze collagen fiber formation and capillary health, wound healing. We all know that. It's very important for the biosynthesis, biosynthesis of carnitine, serotonin, and certain other neurotransmitters, including norepinephrine. That is true that vitamin C is needed for the uh, production of norepinephrine, but uh, the reason why, just so you know, folks, is that the way that the pathway goes is phenylalanine, an amino acid, forms tyrosine, tyrosine forms dopa. Dopa forms dopamine. And to get dopa, to L-dopa to dopamine, you need vitamin C. If you don't have enough vitamin C, you can't form enough dopamine, and therefore you can't form the next chemical compound, which is norepinephrine. So vitamin C is very important. It's essential for that line of stress production, stress hormone production. And we know that vitamin C is one of the most powerful antioxidants in humans and animals. It's water-soluble, unless you get a fat-soluble form of vitamin C, which does have some, there are some reasons to use fat-soluble forms, but uh, nature did intend for vitamin C to be water-soluble, so uh, I keep it pretty simple. Vitamin C interacts with glutathione, meaning it tends to increase glutathione's uh, utility in the body, which is a tripeptide, and also uh, alpha lipoic acid, and regenerates vitamin E. Now, one last point on this page. Vitamin C is an antioxidant, that is true. But if an oxidant, every antioxidant is an oxidant at some point. If the patient does not have the appropriate complement of antioxidants, then they might turn a lot of these so-called antioxidants into oxidants, which could, which could be a, a very dangerous thing. So you don't have to believe me. Just look at a biochemistry book, and you'll see how ascorbic acid does convert into the highly reactive oxidant dehydroascorbic acid. So we always want to give the proper antioxidants a class of synergistic family here. Now, the buffered vitamin C from nutritional frontiers is derived from beets. That's a, fu a found foundational and fundamental and fantastic thing that they have done there. We don't want corn. And your patients will ask you, and if they don't, you tell them. You tell them why your buffered C is, is different. You also let them know it's buffered C. Most individuals have a tendency towards acidity in their blood. Are they really acid? No, they're not. The blood pH is generally 7.35 to 7.45. But we have these people that are subclinically acidotic walking around with 7.30s. That, that can cause a lot of degenerative, inflammatory, and oxidative stress and disease. In fact, we know it does. Buffered C helps to shift that low pH higher. Low is more acid. Higher is obviously more alkaline. I can't help but say the following. I hear a lot of practitioners and patients will say to me, Dr. Wald, but I thought we should be alkaline. Now, if it's a healthcare provider, I'll say, well, we need to be 7.35 or so in the blood. So that's to the left of neutral. We need to be on the acidic side in the urine because alkal alkaline urine predisposes to urinary tract infections. That's why we give probiotics like lactobacillus acidophilus to provide the acid bacteria. And then in our mouths, we need to be alkaline because of amylase in our stomach. We need to be acid. So there's no being alkaline. It has no meaning. I did a show called uh, PH Lies, which you can listen on my, uh, my website at blooddetective.com under the blog section. Vitamin C, a few more things. It's pH balancing, as I mentioned, but sometimes you may need to use an acid form of vitamin C, particularly if the patient is hypochlorhydric, if they have low stomach acid. Vitamin C reduces not just lead toxicity and neurotoxicity, but toxicity from other heavy metals. When they try to induce toxic problems with metals, but they also treat the patient with vitamin C, they usually don't get the problems. And we know, as I mentioned, that we want to use vitamin C with other antioxidants. It protects them from oxidation, except in cancer. And in cancer, intravenous vitamin C, you heard it here first, is not, does not act as an antioxidant. It acts as an oxidant. That's how it works. If you go to pubmed.com, 
publishmedicalarticles.com, which is a National Library of Medicine, and put in intravenous vitamin C and cancer mechanism of action, you'll see what I mean. We know that buffered C can worsen UTIs because if someone's already alkaline, that, that, can, that can, of course, worsen the UTI and keep it down. We want to use probiotics. If your patient is a vegan like myself and you want to convert non-heme iron and plants to heme iron, we give vitamin C with it. It is important to know that vitamin C and other antioxidants, so-called antioxidants, can reduce radiation effects. If my patients say to me, Doc, what can I do? My other doctor wants me to get a CT scan or an X-ray. I load them up with anti, uh, antioxidants, uh, usually in the form of a phytonutrient powders or superfoods. And the very last thing here I'm going to jump to is vitamin C is contraindicated in patients with G6PD deficiency. If you give a patient vitamin C with that deficiency, not only might you get a lawsuit, but you can cause hemolysis and even death of that patient. Now we're going to go to Betazyme. Betazyme is a combination of pancreatic what? enzymes, herbs, betaine hydrochloride, which is stomach acid, and a few other goodies. So we all know that we need betaine HCL as uh, stomach acid. And pancreatic enzymes are a protein, lipase, and amylase. Gentian root is quite special. Not only can it reflexively stimulate the gallbladder and pancreas, but gentian root helps to repair the stomach lining, the parietal cells or the chief cells of the stomach, so they make they can come back from hypochlorhydria. On this page, you can see that in this product, Betazyme, we have animal-derived enzymes because they have a wider pH range of bioavailability. Plant enzymes don't work in as wide of a range. I'm not at all saying they're useless. I'm simply saying that this one works in a wider range of pH, either high pHs or low pHs. It works very well. One of the things about enzymes which is important is that enzymes, when you give them to patients, can help induce what's called a, what I call a physiologic rest effect. I actually made that up. But what, I, what that is, is that when you give the enzymes to your patients, their body doesn't have to make as much enzyme. The body doesn't have to make as much stomach acid. The gallbladder, the liver does not have to work as hard. Maybe they've been working hard for a while, which is why the patient has symptoms of digestive issues, either involving the stomach, the small intestine, the colon, of course, and, and pancreatic and gallbladder. So you give them betazyme, generally as suggested here. What I tend to do with betazyme is I give it one, uh, one per meal to the patient with the meal. If they don't have any adverse symptoms after the first day, the next day I'll have them double it to two, three times per day when they have three meals. If they have four meals, we don't do it again. The third day, if they're good to go, they don't have heartburn, they don't have loose stool, they don't have indigestion, I keep increasing until they have some mild side effects and then I tell them to stop. All of this, you would want to write up on a sheet of paper, have your patient sign it because it'll be an informed consent, which tells them exactly what to do. You're protected, they're protected, everyone understands. So beta design we want to use with protein starch and fat digesting issues. And uh, I wanted to mention the autoimmune, what I call polypeptide effect. I made that turn up myself as well, as far as I'm aware. Enzymes do two basic things, at least. One is they help digestion. That's obvious. If you take them with your food, that's when they help digestion more or less. However, sometimes you can take Betazyme away from foods or have your patients do that 30 minutes or so, and that will give you more of a pancreatic support. But here's what I mean. Let's back up. Enzymes help digestion and when they're taken with food, but when, in general, when they're taken away from food, they tend to have more metabolic effects in the body. Some of the pancreatic enzymes are known to survive the digestive tract they reach the blood, and in the blood, they help digest autoimmune antibodies. That's why I call it the autoimmune polypeptide effect. There are literally receptors in the small intestine for these enzymes, and they can get through. A leaky gut is not all bad. A leaky gut being leaky 
increases the space between the tight junctions of the small intestine, actually allowing some of these enzymes to get through and do some interesting things like fix the leaky gut, among other things. Very interesting. So some of the indications, of course, include bloating, belching, and flatulence. And also, I should say clinically, when the patient says to you that they have digestive symptoms or any symptoms, when they eat within about a half an hour, they probably have a hypochlorhydric problem. They probably have low stomach acid because that's the first place, obviously, digestion takes place other than the mouth with the starch enzymes, amylase. And if the patient says that they have symptoms that begin about an hour or more after meals, that generally means more pancreatic. But what I like about this combination is you don't have to think that much. The only people you don't want to give this to are people with a history of ulcers. There are some other minor uh, contraindications, but that's, that's a big one. And then as we go down the list, heartburn, indigestion, diarrhea, constipation, undigested food in the stool, that's a giveaway. Acne, which almost always has a gut connection along with rectal, rectal itching and chronic candida. And again, for the students, heartburn, your patients may misunderstand. They might have heartburn and they might say, well, why are you giving me this product that has stomach acid? Heartburn is caused fundamentally by a gastroesophageal valve. The valve between the esophagus and the stomach is obviously open. Otherwise, stomach acid contents could not come into the esophagus causing heartburn. So that's an autonomic nervous system issue. However, if you get the right enzyme and acid balance going, then that will produce a neural hormonal feedback to the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems to control the tonicity of that gastroesophageal valve. And then that will stop heartburn and you have given the patient a product with stomach acid in it. Omega-3 D2. So, this product has our wonderful vitamin D, which we all know is uh, famous, <laughs> and also omega-3 marine oil uh, in the form of EPA and DHA. As a little clinical pearl on the side, EPA, much better for cardiovascular, DHA for neurologic conditions. Sometimes I will use this supplement, and then I will use additional DHA for neurologic conditions or more EPA for cardiovascular, but this is a beautiful balance. You can read about the ingredients on your own or look at the, the Nutritional Frontiers website. The indications, some of them are obvious, cardiovascular health, hair and skin health, supporting blood pressure, vasculature, nervous system health, as I mentioned, general organ function. You know, most cells in the body have bilipid membranes. They require phospholipids. DHA is the most abundant phospholipid in the cells of the body uh, and an even higher concentration in the nervous system. Joint, muscle, bone health, and comfort because omega-3s produce prostaglandin E3s, which are anti-inflammatory mediators. Gastrointestinal health, respiratory, immune, autoimmune. I cannot think of a single reason or condition that I would not give omega-3s unless the patient, of course, is on blood thinners, then uh, you should not do that. And of course, omega-3s will support hormonal balance within uh, normal ranges in a number of patients all by themselves. Uh, I gave you a couple of other clinical pearls here regarding the use of uh, omega-3s and D together. So with nocturnal enuresis, studies showed combined use of omega-3s and D reduced the number of events among seven to 15 year olds that urinate in their beds at night. It's such a stressful thing for these poor kids and for the parents, but good studies on the combination of omega-3 and Ds for that, probably because of their effects upon the autonomic nervous system. Overall, the next note here, vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids, co-supplementation for six weeks, have uh, positive effects upon blood sugar and insulin levels and can, of course, reduce serum triglycerides, increase LDLs, decreasing overall cholesterol levels. And importantly, also omega-3s help reduce the LDL small particles and instead increase the number of LDL large particles, which is 
has a better cardiovascular outcome. Vitamin D enhances omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acid apoptosis in breast cancer cells and many other cancer cells. Both omega-3s and vitamin D are very much anti-cancer. Together, that synergism uh, causes more apoptosis or programmed cell death in uh, cancer cells. And a profile of body composition, omega-3 and D, they looked at National Football League players and they found when they gave these supplements, their body composition improved. Folks, there is no better biomarker of morbidity and mortality than body composition. So therefore also, the omega-3 and D will help the body resist sarcopenia, which is loss of lean body mass and offsets malnutrition and promotes immune balance. Vitamin K2. So this is a product with vitamin A, D, and K2. These are all fat soluble. Remember that? A, D, E, and K are fat soluble, but so is CoQ10, so are omega-3s, they're beta carotene, those are all fat soluble. Lipoic acid is both fat and water soluble. That's unique, by the way, about lipoic acid. So K2 helps bone structure, bone density, overall integrity, bone remodeling, calcium utilization. Folks, people are deficient in K2 or insufficient, meaning their blood levels look okay, but they've got breast cancer, they have hardening of the arteries, they have bone loss, they have arthritis. What do all those things have in common? Think of it this way. When the bone is, when the body's deficient in K2, the bones lose calcium. The body says, where do I stick this calcium? Puts it in joints, arthritis. Puts it in the breast tissue, calcium-laden breast cysts, preemptive to breast cancer, and also puts it in arteries, causing atherosclerosis, hardening of arteries. Not to mention, the anti-cancer effects of these three are absolutely remarkable, and they're all three in one place, A, D3, and K2. So I have uh, certainly pregnant uh, women or nursing women need to be careful. You're not gonna just give these to, to these uh, patients, obviously. Blood clotting disorders and uh, Coumadin, because Coumadin or Warfarin, as you know, is a blood thinner. And K2 is a pro-clotting agent, okay? You can think of K for clotting. It doesn't really mean that, but it's an easy way to remember it. Um, okay. And in terms of the vitamin A component of this product, uh, you know, vitamin A is as exciting as vitamin D. It just doesn't get all the, all the press. Everything that I mentioned that vitamin D does, vitamin A pretty much does. And all of these support bone health, all three of these in this particular product. Vitamin D3, let's talk about that for a moment again. It's fat soluble. We know it's essential for maintaining calcium balance. Now, vitamin D3, vitamin D in the blood, the range for most labs is 30 to 100. Meta-analysis says 70 is the magic number. The higher normal vitamin D, the lower one's overall morbidity mortality. How do you know if you're giving someone too much vitamin D? No, it's not if the plasma serum levels are a little high. It's if they have hypercalcemia. If their calcium is elevated, you know to reduce the vitamin D. I would stop it for a week, possibly two, check the calcium level again. If it's normal, I start the D again and I start at a lower dose. How much vitamin D do you give someone? If their blood level is below 30 and they're of normal weight, you give them 50,000 units of vitamin D3. If they're overweight, you give them 100,000 once a week, folks, for eight weeks. Then you recheck the lab and then you titrate the vitamin D down. This particular study was a one-year double-blind double blind randomized control trial looking at the effects of melatonin, strontium, vitamin D, and K2 on bone mineral density in osteoporotic uh, women in the average age that we will tend to see most of our patients, 49 to 75, and they'll be women. So these findings in this study provide both clinical and mechanistic support for the use of the combination of these nutrients for the treatment and prevention of osteopenia, osteoporosis, and not just bone-related diseases. Remember, bone loss does give a higher cancer predisposition. It will cause increased cardiovascular risk. Calcium dysmetabolism also is involved in central nervous system problems. That's not talked about much, but it's essential for neuroplasticity. So this product, I love the combination of these supplements. I should mention 
vitamin A toxicity or D toxicity or K could look also like elevated liver enzymes, one or a few of them. Let's talk about vitamin K2, A, and D studies, a few important ones I thought you should know about. So vitamin K2, first of all, can suppress gut risk microbes and promotes beneficial microbial metabolites, which lower cancer predisposition in the gut. So vitamin K2 is, first of all, made by the intestinal uh, milieu, the bugs, but most people do not have a very healthy intestinal uh, microflora, as you know. So these products that I've been mentioning throughout this conversation today, these are fundamental for just about everyone. Also, vitamin K2 supports the concept that if you can modify the NF kappa beta signal transduction, we can improve bone health, bone health by offsetting bone loss. So vitamin K2 said another way, lowers this inflammatory NF kappa B. There's a few other examples I've given in this note here where they, there was a 270 day course of vitamin K2 in patients with uh, chronic uh, kidney disease and they reduced the progression of their atherosclerosis and their vascular calcification reduced. I've done this many times and vitamin K2 significantly changed the level of the calcification promoters. Those are other chemical mediators we don't have time to talk about today. So vitamin K has diverse protective effects against osteoporosis, osteopenia, atherosclerosis, and carcinogenic, carcinogenesis on a number of levels. So here we are, we're at the end of our conversation. I really do hope that everyone enjoyed the, uh, the conversation and we're gonna take some questions at some point right now and uh, we'll just go right into that. Yes, so if anybody has any questions, they can go ahead and type it in the chat window. I want to keep everybody on mute just because we had a ton of background noise, and I think it would be too hard for everyone to speak all at once. So any questions, go ahead and type them in the chat. While we're waiting for any questions in the chat window, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Wald. This was a very interesting lecture, lots and lots of useful information. I mean, I loved the detail-oriented nature. Uh, I'm a nutritionist as well as blood chemistry guy myself, so you're speaking my language, and I just wanted to say thank you from all of us. Well, thank you so much. I, it means a lot coming from you. Great. Let's see. First question, what does the sample blood detective report provide, and what does it show? Okay. So once again, briefly, uh, if you email me at info at blooddetective.com, I'll give you instructions where you can actually run one of those reports. And what it's going to provide is this. You simply type in the results of the blood test into the system, and then you click create evaluation report. And what it'll provide is a generic and specific company suggestions of supplements based on that patient's chemistry. You can put in one blood test or up to 170 blood tests. So it'll give you supplements specific for the patient's biochemical individuality, and it'll also give you uh, food suggestions and also recommend other tests, alert you to uh, pharmacologic interactions with nutrition and all other sorts of fun stuff. And how much does this report usually cost? Uh, the, the cost of each report is $25 to the practitioner or student. And generally what I do is I charge the patient for each report. I charge $130 for it. I, I actually read my own reports. I learn from them because my system is smarter than I am, even though I wrote it. And um, I do blood work with a patient probably on average every three months. And it could be also sooner or later, depending on what specific tests you know I need to compare, and that's the sort of practice management uh, answer to your question. Or uh, practitioners can purchase unlimited reports for a month for $400, or they can own the system for life, including all updates, for $4,900. Okay. I know we have a lot of students that use Ulta Labs, so they have access to ordering the blood work, but sometimes need a little bit of help understanding it, so that might be a useful tool. Yeah. Right. I should just mention real quickly that even for practitioners, depending on your state that, uh, let's say, cannot order blood, as long as you can get your hands on the patient's blood tests, then you can run them and create reports. And then this report, you generally review with the patient over the course of several consultations. Great. 
All right, so it doesn't seem like we have very many other questions coming through. So I think you did a very good job of expressing the information that you were presenting. Let's see, what type of blood work is needed to be submitted for the blood detective report? Any specific type will do, question mark? Good. So, you know, I do recommend a certain minimum that would be ideal to give you a super thorough report. But as I mentioned earlier, you can ask the blood detective to interpret one test for you or 10 or 20 tests. But basically, you'd want a CBC, a complete blood count, along with a comprehensive uh, metabolic panel. And then I like to do, of course, a, a fasting lipid panel on the patients, a ferritin, a homocysteine, and a C-reactive protein and a thyroid panel. If you give a detective these, you're gonna get one heck of a report. The report lengths can go anywhere from 10 pages to 110 pages, but don't worry. You're not printing these reports on paper. You're printing them to PDFs and you're encrypting them and emailing them to the patient if they want them. And I sh I'm a paperless office, so I show my patients the results and how they compare to healthy and that super excites them and what their weak body systems are on a screen on my desk. So these, my, my topics again, just a quick review, CBC, comprehensive metabolic panel, a lipid panel, a ferritin, homocysteine, CRP cardio, not CRP standard, and a thyroid panel. Okay, great. Now the next question, let's see, can pregnant or breastfeeding women use Adrena Max 3? Okay, so I'm going to give you the politically correct answer, and then I'm going to give you what I do. So the politically correct answer is no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't give pregnant women herbs because not enough studies have been done, et cetera, et cetera. Every office should have an informed consent in place that every new patient signs. And it also says in that, and if you should become pregnant, it's your responsibility to tell the practitioner, et cetera, et cetera. So because, you know, if something happens to a pregnant woman, that you, things happen that uh, you don't want to have happen. So having said that, no, you don't want to give them to a pregnant woman. Uh, what I do is I inform uh, those patients, those women that are pregnant, uh, that uh, there is a risk, uh, that I believe the risk is small, that can create any issues, but that there is not enough study in this area, and I describe the potential benefits, and I let them make their choice, and I have them sign my informed consent. Okay. And then one more question. Let's see. Do you have recommendations for product with adaptogens if client cannot use licorice? Um, hmm. The answer to that question really should be based upon some knowledge of the client. Because although we've been talking in generalized terms here, uh, as you know, every, every patient is different. Uh, I would invite you to give me some extra details in an email. So at email at um, info at bloodtective.com. And give me not a whole page of detail, but give me about 10 bullet points, and then I can be more specific to that question. Good. And then the last question I will take, I was asked about the transcript for this. We're also going to give you a video recording. That email should come within a few days. We're going to kind of clean it up and make sure that we have it branded correctly, and you will get a video link in email and possibly with some um, – advertisements and specials from Nutritional Frontiers because they are a preferred partner. And then that should come with just in a few days, so don't worry there. So you'll have all of this information ready at your fingertips. Now, Candice, did you have a quick question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Sure. I just was wanting Dr. Wall to restate why he uses Nutritional Frontiers products and the services that the company offers. I know he went over that in the beginning, but if you could just go over that quickly one more time. Sure, um, and thanks for asking that because I really do want to express my gratitude to Nutritional Frontiers. Uh, I mentioned uh, that I've been uh, in the clinical nutrition field for nearly 28 years. I've worked with a lot of companies. I've lectured all over uh, the world. It's been a wonderful ride for me, and uh, I've been, become a bit disenchanted lately with some of the third-party assays of some of the uh, companies that I've been uh, using. And then I investigated Nutritional Frontiers, and I was so impressed with the, the evidence base that they provided uh, to me. 
Uh, they responded extremely quickly to my, my questions. And as you might imagine, I asked for a lot of information. They gave it all to me almost immediately. I was astounded. And uh, I verified the doses on their bottles based on studies on uh, the National Library of Medicine. So the long story short is this company, in my view, has um, a very strong integrity base that I appreciate because we're dealing with, with people's lives. And I also take these supplements. So it's very important for me to, to feel comfortable. And, and that's, and that is why. Awesome. So we've got two more questions and I think we're going to call it a night. And if you have any other questions, you can go ahead and email them to nutritional frontiers. And we'll include that email in the blast that we send out after this meeting. So the, one of the last questions was stating, can we take too many enzymes and does the body become immune to them? That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. So in terms of enzymes, when a patient takes enzymes, uh, that causes that physiologic rest effect over time that I mentioned, where you give enzymes to the patient. So the endogenous production of enzymes uh, might already be low. But by giving them enzymes, the pancreas, the enzyme pancreas can regenerate so that it can produce its own enzymes eventually in some people. Most patients in my practice are particularly ill and they're generally on enzymes pretty much for life. There's, there's no reason why I would wanna take them off as long as they're feeling good with them. So in terms of adverse effects of continuing, well, if you have a patient on enzymes and they say to you that they are developing some adverse effect, maybe it's, let's say it's heartburn or they're getting loose stool or whatever the, the thing may be, then yeah, you might want to look at reducing their enzymes and adjusting them because the supplements that we recommend, just like our dietary suggestions and lifestyle recommendations, what they are initially may change multiple times over the course of, of managing people in, and then we want to teach them how to deal with, uh, with changing th certain things on their own. So I have not come across against many examples. I'm trying to think of even one where I wouldn't, have, uh, wouldn't keep my patient uh, on the enzymes. And the same goes for stomach acid, particularly if these people are over age 50. 60% of people over age 50 are hypochlorhydric. And when you have low stomach acid and that food isn't properly digested and then it makes its way into the small intestine, the pancreas, the enzyme pancreas overworks and that throws off the whole intestinal uh, milieu. So when we're dealing with people in this world with these kinds of stressors, with these poor diets, uh, I welcome the use of enzymes even for a lifetime. Great. And then the last question that we're going to ask is once bowel tolerance is obtained with vitamin C, what would that dosage be? Uh, I missed part of your question. I think you said, what is the bowel tolerance um, that's achieved with vitamin C? Is that right? Yes. And then they asked, okay. what would the dosage be once, once met? Oh, got it. Good. So the dosage once met of vitamin C would be, so the patient is taking, let's say, um, they're taking two capsules of, of vitamin C, and then 30 minutes later, they take another two capsules and another... 30 minutes to take another two. And then let's say they get to 10 capsules and then they get diarrhea. First of all, what vitamin C has done there is it has basically filled up most cells in, in the body uh, and uh, including the cells that are the intestinal tract. And then they cause contraction of the two muscular layers of the colon. So it exercises the colon as opposed to colonics, which do have their place, but colonics stretch the bowel wall out. They remove the endogenous probiotics. These are not issues you have with very inexpensive vitamin C. But to answer your question, if it's 10 capsules that it took to cause diarrhea, then approximately two thirds of that, or roughly eight capsules is what that patient should have in two to three equally divided doses or roughly equally divided doses per day. Fantastic. So, okay. Yeah, just well, one last thing on that. It's it's some amount less than what produced the flush, which is diarrhea. Great. All right. Well, again, I want to thank you, Dr. Wald, for taking the time to share this information with everybody. And I want to thank Nutritional Frontiers thank for you. linking you up with us and having you be a representation of the information that we love to share. Thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure.
Thank you. And I want to tell everyone, thank you for the time for listening. And we're going to go ahead and end this meeting. And we will send out the recording as soon as we have it ready. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.